Hello everyone, this is Dave Thompson. I am your host here at Beyond Clean With Ace, where the cleaning industry talks about, well, just about anything and everything. Today we're going to be talking about indoor air quality, uh, a series of podcasts that is sponsored by the Center for Education and Safety, part of the Missouri School Boards Association. And I'm not by myself. Matter of fact, we've got quite a panel of people going to join us throughout the afternoon. So if you're in a school, mainly in Missouri, but maybe any public school around the United States or across the world, and you're concerned about keeping students healthy, keeping the classrooms well safe, and well, basically your community as a whole, this indoor air quality podcast is for you. First of all, I want to bring on Luke Gard. If I can find him somewhere here on the list, there he is. There's Luke. And um, Luke, do we have uh, audio with you? Here we Sorry, go. I was on. Sorry, I was on mute there for a second. There we go. Luke, uh, who are you? What are we doing other than your name? Uh, my name is Luke Gard, and I work at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. I'm also part of and do consulting for the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit here in the Midwest region. And at Children's Mercy, we have a healthy schools program um, that's been active for about the last 15 or 16 years. And over the last couple of years, as we've discussed in the prior um, webcasts and podcasts, um, we've been working with the state of Missouri, three primary entities, um, the Missouri School Plant Managers Association, the Missouri School Nurses Association, and the Missouri uh, School Board Association to basically develop um, kind of aligned goals, um, fact sheets, information, resources, things like that um, to help um, basically facility managers, school nurses, um, school boards, administrators, et cetera, with managing their buildings, particularly during COVID-19. Now, folks, if you think that's a list, let's bring on another person and see if we can add to the list here. This is Saloom, and uh, he's from over in the Kansas City, Missouri area, if I remember correctly. Uh, that, that's correct, David. Uh, my name is Saloom Stetzer, and I serve as the Director of Facilities and Purchasing for the Independence Public Schools. I've uh, been serving in this capacity here in this district uh, going on six years, uh, but collectively I've uh, got 18 plus years of experience uh, both at the uh, public uh, sector as well as the private sector um, in higher education and facility management. Well, welcome to the podcast. This is your first uh, run with us here at the uh, at this particular uh, set. But Saloom and I have known each other for a number of years. Matter of fact, I was up at uh, a Plant Managers Association uh, conference here just recently, and we got to connect again. Thank you for being on the panel, Saloom. No problem. Happy to be here. And well, finally, we're going to add uh, Kyle here. And uh, uh, Kyle, you're over in Missouri, too. Well, not quite in Kansas City area. Sure, I'm Dave uh, in uh, Lee Summit, Missouri, and uh, I'm the director of facilities for Lee Summit School District. Um, and as Saloom is, we're both uh, uh, heavily involved um, and on the board with the Missouri School Plant Managers Association. Gentlemen, I want to kind of start by what we've been talking about here over the last two podcasts. And um, uh, Kyle, one of the podcasts that we were talking about was based on a lot of things that your district there, at least someone has been doing. Um, I don't want to rehash all the old things, but in case somebody hasn't listened to one of the other podcasts, give us kind of a brief rundown on maybe some of those innovative things you've done. Well, um, boy, let's see. It's a big topic, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, we've got a couple hour presentation on indoor air quality, but um, you know, it really starts with contaminant sources, evaluating where your contaminant sources are in your buildings. And that's what Luke has been a great asset for and helping people understand um, what, um, what contaminants are and where they come from. Um, then it comes down to your mechanical systems and making sure that you meet the, the current codes 
Um, ASHRAE 62.1 is the ventilation code. Um, and then 52.2 is the code that um, talks about filter testing and what filters are adequate to, to screen out certain particles. So we've talked a lot in the past about what is ventilation, making sure that you have proper ventilation um, and outside air, making sure you're filtering that air adequately um, and managing the humidity in the buildings. So those are kind of the big buckets that we've talked about in the past. Kyle, you and I have kind of followed that um, mechanical part of it with basically the everyday uh, front, what I call the front line protectors of health, and that's the custodians, what they do, the challenges they face. Uh, let's kind of give a little overview of that. Yeah, and I can turn this back over to Luke too, but he's one that really brought up to us that, um, you know, a lot of these hand sanitizers that um, we've used are their respiratory irritants. And so when you've got every classroom, you've got just this constant pumping and spraying of um, whether it's a disinfectant or hand sanitizer, that um, that creates an indoor quality issue in itself in our classrooms. So, Luke, you can, I'll turn it over to you, Luke. I don't need to steal all the thunder, but. Yeah, basically just, and I think this goes back to a lot of what happened initially during the pandemic um, back in 2020, March, April, May, June, um, is these two gentlemen here were inundated with anything and everything that people thought would help them manage their buildings. So whether it was UV lighting, um, needlepoint bipolar ionization, um, new chemical products, new processes. And so a lot of the folks in the Kansas City area just reached out asking for guidance. And um, I think one of the things that we talk about is we need to use the hand sanitizer. We understand the importance of that but you can also use some logic in where you use it. Um, if you're heading back into a classroom, do you wanna use the san hand sanitizer out in the hallway? Um, or do you wanna use it as you're entering the classroom in the classroom where you're gonna have 30 students sitting for the next hour and a half? So some of it's just the logic of if we have to use these products, how can we best use them without exposing the occupants to some of the, the hazards associated with their use. So Luke, what was the what was the the, the the discussion? How did it, do I use it outside in the hall or do I use it in the classroom where everybody's got to smell the alcohol? Well, I think it's the answer is it depends. <laughs> so <laughs> if, you're, if you're leaving for lunch, then it may be good to use it at the door inside the classroom because you're not gonna be in the classroom for 30 or 45 minutes while you're at lunch. If you're heading back into the classroom and you're distributing the hand sanitizer, maybe it's better to use it out in the hallway because then that way you haven't just used, you know, 30 squirts or 60 squirts of hand sanitizer in the classroom. So it, it depends a little bit. It's just using kind of common sense and logic to minimize those exposure risks. You know, gentlemen, as, as somebody that suffers from, from COPD and, and, and before asthma, you know, alcohol sanitizers and me just don't get along. Mm hmm. You know, and we um, really in the recommendation and talking with Luke too, um, have tried the best we can to, to move away from the quaternary disinfectants for the same reason. You know, we have custodians in spraying down everything with quaternary disinfectants that again are respiratory irritants. And um, so that was always okay at night because custodians were cleaning at night. But now that we want to put those products in teachers' hands and having them using them in between classes, um, you know, it didn't work real well. So we've got um, in all of our buildings um, stabilized aqueous ozone, just ozonated water, you know, that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, it is not technically an endless disinfectant, but um, it is a very, very uh, capable um, sanitizer and uh, and a good cleaner and is, frankly, it's just water, ozonated water. Um, we've also tried some, um, you know, like hydrogen peroxides and hypochlorous acid, different things like that that are less harmful, but frankly, they're just so expensive. Um, you know, we were so, mixed. So, so, so Lume and I have talked recently, but you, you get to be stuck kind of here in the middle. You're, you've got the housekeeping department custodians, and then you got to do the purchasing. And from what I'm hearing Kyle and Luke say here, uh, what is it that you go and purchase whenever you've got all of this and everybody wants you to do everything? 
Yeah, and, and, and similar to what uh, Kyle and Luke have already shared, um, I, I think every district has to look at what um, what is best for for their respective, um, I guess, organization slash institution. And I think a part of that, um, respective to your question, is really trying to find that happy medium of what, what worked for us. So what we did, um, respective to the topic that we're covering right now, is we really worked with our, our, our longtime chemical partner and looked at what a what other products they're able to um, to supply and, and generate. I looked at um, the product that Kyle uh, utilized, but we we ultimately decided to to stay with uh, our current product uh, just because we were really focused on uh, the disinfecting piece of it, and um, it worked very well for us. Now the challenge was getting our hands on it uh, because, as with with all things, uh, there was this. Uh, disruption in the supply chain and, and still continue to have those challenges. Uh, but with a long-term partnership that we had with our cleaning provider from a chemical standpoint. Uh, so, you know, we've got a lot of people listening to the podcast that, you know, whenever you talk about indoor air quality, they go, really? You're talking about cleaning chemicals here in this segment. Um, you know, one of the things I teach here at the academy is get rid of a trigger sprayer have a squirt top and don't atomize the product so people breathe it. Um, is that a solution that is viable? It is. Uh, in fact, at the, at the height of COVID, and uh, it's actually best practice right now for us, uh, we've moved to really disinfecting with charging buckets, right? So we're still using the uh, um, <coughs> our, our normal disinfectant, but rather than spraying it and getting all of the various contaminants in the air, we use charging buckets and uh, wipe down all of our surfaces and touch points, including handles and drinking fountains and uh, dust desktops. So what I'm hearing the, the guys say here at the start of our podcast is, you know, we you have to look at all the options. And and Luke, you mentioned earlier in one of the podcasts we did about some of the tips and tricks that people use. Um, Charging buckets top down, uh, you know, that's another one of those things that people can do instead of spraying like we always have done. And I think um, I think Saloon summed it up perfectly. You really have to do what works for your district. And there's a little bit of trial and error in that. Um, but I think one of the things that Saloon highlighted was that he was able to utilize the relationship that he'd had with his cleaning vendor um, and he leveraged that to make sure he had the products that he needed um, and that, that they were doing what he hoped and they, they, they promised that they were going to do. Um, I do have a quick question for Saloom. Um, Saloom, did the vendor actually provide your staff additional training during COVID-19 as far as maybe cleaning techniques, things like that? Or did they offer that as an option? No, uh, really. Um... <clears throat> They did offer it as an option, and we actually did introduce a couple of uh, really one additional chemical. Uh, when we did have some positive tests, there was a, an additional higher concentrated uh, disinfectant that we introduced that required our staff to go through some additional cleaning uh, from a PPE standpoint. I said cleaning, but what I meant was training from a PPE standpoint. And so, yeah, they, they were a good partner to lean on um, when we've introduced a few uh, uh, new new tools to our toolbox, if you will. Uh, but really the charging buckets, that really kind of came from just kind of doing the, um, the, the research in terms of best practices and uh, what, what worked in terms of limiting uh, irritants into the uh, the educational space. You know, Salum, as, as, as I'm listening to the two of you talk about this, I'm thinking, you know, the resources we have are people like you guys right here that have done and went through this. I, I'm going to think there's many people that have done this through the state of Missouri over the last couple of years. Um, I'm just thinking it would be interesting to have people listening to the podcast to give us all of theirs where we could collect it all in one place. I mean, or is that already there? And I just don't know about it. I think what you'll have on that, Dave, is you'll have varying degrees of that. Um, very similar to uh, what we do with the Missouri School Plant Managers in our regional meetings. We get together quarterly. Uh, I know Kyle and I head up the Kansas City region 
and we get together and talk about uh, just various challenges. I, I know during COVID, we said we, we got on that conference call, our quarterly call, and visited with our colleagues in the Kansas City region, and we all shared what uh, we were doing respective to uh, mitigation within our, our own educational systems and districts, um, best practices, and just a, 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 a nice a forum where we can bounce ideas off of each other. And for some of us, we dropped some of our information in our Google Drive uh, to where many of our other members that are, who are part of Missouri School Plant Managers can go access that for that purpose, help their respective school districts. Kyle, I'm going to come back to you then. Uh, you're part of the, the School Boards Association. Is this available for people to get readily? Well, it sure is. Um, you know, MSPMA.com easy website to get to. Um, it is a, um, an organization that will take anyone who wants to be a member. Um, and frankly, I don't remember exactly what our membership fee is, but it's not very expensive. I think it's a $150 a year. Um, so yeah, it's a great, great organization. And Dave, I know you've been to our conference and uh, have some really great uh, educational opportunities there. Um, you know, and I, I was just going to throw out there too, from an indoor air quality standpoint, um, many of you in the Kansas City area, if you're listening here, we've had some grass fires and fires burning around the area um, over the weekend. It's Monday right now. And um, we are still suffering with some res residual uh, smoke odors. And we've had complaints all across the the district this morning about people smelling smoke in their buildings. So that's just another indoor air quality um, issue that sometimes can just pop up. Um, we've had gas leaks before, gas mains out completely unrelated to our school that have created concern. People can smell things. So, you know, with our HVAC controls, we have the ability to, um, for short periods of time, we'll shut down outside air sometimes. Um, just to try to mitigate those external um, odors that can infiltrate your building. Well, air quality still comes from outside. We still have to use that, and that is a product of the environment. Uh, I, I, cannot, I can't tell you how many schools that I have went through across the country, and the first thing I do is start evaluating the quality of the air before I even get into the building, because if it's poor... Um, as you said, it's only for a short period of time that you can close that down. You have to have fresh air coming in. Mm -hmm. So right. then you, you have to talk about how you're going to filter all that stuff during that time. So I'm thinking um, you, you shut it down for a period of time. Uh, smoke has particulate in it. You've got to now change filters quickly. Oh, I don't know that uh, it's probably going to have a significant load factor on the filter, but um, and that's something that we would look at. Um, that that filter could pick up some of that odor and then just keep re-entraining it in the building. Um. Gentlemen, whenever we're talking about indoor air quality here, we're talking about um, uh, things that we put in the air. I know that whenever I was dealing with the green cleaning laws there in Missouri, uh, we also talked about uh, deodorants, uh, shampoos, uh, these kind of things, P things that people bring in from outside. Uh, I'm still thinking this is also an issue. Yeah, very much so. Um, this is we've, we've done a good job uh, when we've implemented kind of our indoor air quality uh, key performance indicators as we've kind of built our program. Um, really our, our, our largest offenders are our own occupants, you know, uh, <laughs> from, a, from a staff standpoint, bringing in Glade plugins, uh, those types of, you know, candles, all of those um, various products have a certain level of VOCs that are introduced into, um, the, you know, the environment should they bring them. So we've worked over the years to really uh, develop internal uh, policies and procedures um, am I going to sit here and, and say that we're always 100% uh, compliant? No, but uh, we, we typically walk through a building and uh, we know kind of where our key uh, offenders are. We, we generally have to remind them every now and then. Uh, but, but to your point, yes, um, you know, we really, through policy and planning, we, we limit 
the number of uh, external uh, products brought in that, that have high content in terms of VOCs. Uh, really, for us, we don't allow them. And uh, when we do find them, we work with the respective uh, individuals to remove them because I know for me personally, I've had uh, a couple of situations where we had a student uh, that, that had, you know, uh, breathing challenges uh, due, due to a specific environment, and that was a key contributor for it. Yeah, so no more of the hot plates with the scented candle sitting on it. No, sir. Nope. I saw the other two guys smiling when we said that, Luke, uh, I, I think we even kind of uh, talked a little bit about that before. Yeah, there's definitely, it's not just a respiratory hazard, but when you start talking about leaving a hot plate on with wax on it over the weekend and leaving that on for 48 hours, um, th there's some potential safety hazards as well. And when you're managing a building, you certainly would like to show up Monday morning and have it be there. So um, I think it's a good a good thing to, to minimize those things, not only from a health, but also a safety perspective, depend, depending on what product we're talking about. So then I think that kind of leads over into what we saw in the last couple of years, gentlemen, uh, from a facility management standpoint, everybody had a remedy for everything, as you said, we saw a tremendous amount of these air filters and stuff come in, these portables and stuff. And I think you'd mentioned that a little bit before. Um, that's kind of waning now, but we're now into another season. Uh, well, it's October as we record this, gentlemen. What's the current issues when we come to, it's not COVID, but now it's, I'll tell you, the, the biggest issue we have in the fall is humidity. And, um, you know, we, everyone here in the Midwest knows that we've got a couple months in the spring and fall that um, make it really difficult in our area to control humidity without the right mechanical systems. Um, and kind of remembering back to our previous presentation, um, there's kind of this band, this from indoor air quality, this band of humidity that is the optimum when it comes to reducing the growth of mold spores, um, pollens for um, uh, inhibiting the, the growth of uh, any kind of virus in the air. And that's kind of in that 50 to maybe 65% relative humidity. And so it is really easy this time of year to get outside of that band if you don't have systems uh, that are designed to handle the humidity. So from a facility management standpoint, you're going to move from that time of the year into winter, the dry, uh, dry months as far as humidity. Uh, that all changes then? It does. In the wintertime, it's a little harder to, to manage because dry air is dry air. Schools typically don't put humidifiers in um, to help uh, mitigate that. But yeah, we have dry air in the wintertime and that's uh, at least from a relative humidity standpoint. Um, and, and, and then before school gets out, we go into spring. Um, then, then you have that challenge again. What, what is that another set of issues? It's really the same as the fall. Um, anytime you're in a temperature zone that's close to your occupied space zone, so if you're in the you know, high 60s to low 70s, your, your buildings aren't going to be calling for very much cooling. So your air conditioning isn't really going to run. So some systems, you may not even have your fans running at all when they're not being called for. Um, but then the air conditioning itself is the only thing pulling that moisture out of the air. So if you're not air conditioning, you're not dehumidifying unless you have a, a system designed to do that. Yeah, you know, so folks, what I want you to hear here as the gentlemen have talked uh, uh, this morning or this afternoon, I guess, is, you know, these situations change. All of these affect the way we breathe because it's what's going on inside our environment. Um, it's fall. And as you said, your humidity what is the other respiratory issues that we're dealing with come this time of year? Well, of course, allergies and, you know, seasonal allergies, pollens, um, 
it very high um, high levels of pollen and mold in the air in our area. So um, yeah, that's always a challenge, and um, we get a lot of buildup on on filters. Have to stay on top of filter changes, especially this time of year. Um, we'll see clogging from you know the the spores from the trees and uh, especially cottonwood. There's a lot of cottonwood in our region, and um, that you know, really loads up filters and coils and units, that cotton in the air. So, Loom, I think you were talking about um, an, an outbreak that uh, I know we all deal with the flu. We don't have to even talk about that. Every school has that this time of the year, but there's something else going on. Yeah, RSV. I think everybody is uh, mm -hmm. seeing that in the, in, in the news cycle. Uh, I think I've even seen where uh, a majority of hospitals in several regions are at capacity um, with their beds. And so, you know, and Luke can kind of speak more to the, 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 um, the health side of it, but for us, what we continue to try to do um, is educate um, our, our, our students and occupants about uh, um, just, just safe practices in terms of continuing to wash your hands and doing all of those things that we were doing during COVID. Uh, I will tell you that with some of the that news of RSV kind of breaking out, I think you are starting to see some households individually go back to masking up. Uh -huh. um, and so we always make sure that we have a, uh, a good supply at uh, individual buildings for those that uh, should choose to, to do that. Um, and, you know, at least in our district here, um, we watch the absenteeism rate. And uh, typically when we hit about 5% at uh, any individual building, uh, we'll, we'll mobilize and do additional deep cleaning at that particular uh, school building to, to kind of try to help with that uh, that absenteeism. And, and Luke, so I think both of the guys are going to come over to you because you're at the hospital. So what are we in for? Uh, well, Saloom pointed out one thing. Um, we are definitely at capacity at Children's Mercy at the main hospital. We have zero beds available right now. So um, I think we're seeing that across the Kansas City metro area, not only in children's hospitals, but um, in uh, adult hospitals as well. Um, and I think what's interesting is there was some data and some studies that occurred in those first two years of the pandemic that indicated that both flu and RSV were at lower rates because we were so focused on hand sanitizing and things like that. I think a lot of us have kind of put COVID in the rear view mirror and they're predicting a little bit of a rougher flu and um, flu season this year as a result of kind of going back to maybe some of the bad habits we had as human beings um, prior to the pandemic. So not covering our coughs as well, not washing our hands frequently, things like that. Well, gentlemen, I think we're going to have some uh, other healthcare professionals on our next podcast uh, that are probably going to talk about this in quite some length. Uh, uh, you know, Saluma kind of indicated a little bit before, you know, is it time that we're masking up again? Luke's saying, well, you know what, flu season is going to be bad because we're not paying attention to what we should be doing. And then Kyle's down here saying, well, my filters are all getting clogged up because I got all this stuff in the air. Uh, you make it sound like we're going to have a rough uh, fall and winter from an indoor air quality if we don't pay attention. And I'm not, I don't want to make that sound like it's all negative or anything, but I think that's the reason for the podcast, gentlemen, is we need to pay attention to this and not drop, a, drop the ball and think, well, the pandemic's over, let's go back to life as it was before. Well, and I think that's one thing to have facility managers like Kyle and Saloom. Um, if my kids were attending those districts, I'd feel a little more confident that some of <laughs> some of those boxes are being checked off. So, um, but I do think it, you have to be vigilant and it is a fluid process. So I think as Saloom mentioned earlier, the quarterly meetings um, that the Missouri school plant managers do, um, not only across the state, but in the Kansas City area, would just be a great resource to make sure you're staying atop those things that other people are kind of encountering problems with. And maybe you can prevent a problem before it actually occurs. And I think to add to that also, I know we've talked about several key areas, but having just good preventative maintenance uh, and good cycle replacement on a lot of things, right? 
Um, I'll just touch on two of them. You know, one, one, one of the big things that I always try to do and we try to do as a district is also manage our, uh, our building envelopes, right? Uh, our roofs also play, you know, a part or a role within managing and making sure that we have good indoor air quality. If you have a roof that's leaking like a sieve and is soiling everything in a classroom environment, you're going to have some of the challenges uh, respect to, um, you know, humidity uh, in certain times, as well as uh, the potential for for other contaminants in that environment. So making sure that uh, a district of, of our size, as well as Kyle's size, um, actually, let me just back that up. Any district uh, where they're they're educating uh, students in large quantities uh, should have a pretty good roof replacement cycle because that does play a role into that. The other part, and uh, it was unfortunate to see last week, but here, you know, now <clears throat> with the colder temps that we had last week, uh, many of our uh, heating systems are starting to fire and be able to to provide an, an adequate. Uh, uh, educational environment during heating season and uh, we just completed all of our preventative maintenance on all of our boiler pressure vessels uh, to make sure that all of those are firing and operating um, as they should but uh, that's one of really one of the scariest things that I always you know when those boilers have gone dormant uh, during cooling season and now we're getting ready to fire them up making sure all those heat chambers uh, we don't have any cracks or pinholes in those because um, those can also contribute to a, a very negative uh, indoor air quality environment and introduce uh, carbon monoxide to the environment. So um, I know a local still a local still school district experienced that last week, unfortunately, but they were able to quickly um, kind of mitigate that. So there's a lot of other things just outside of what we we're talking about that really play into uh, uh, indoor air quality and making sure that we're always providing an optimum uh, learning environment for our, our students and our staff and really all educational stakeholders. I think you bring up a good point there, Saloom. Um, you know, as I'm listening to you gentlemen talk about this, I don't think that people really think too much about these issues other than filters. I mean, you know, that seems to be the thing that people want to talk about, but there's so much more to the issue of providing a safe educational and learning environment uh, for the kids, a, a place for people to work, a place for the community to uh, be involved with. Um, it goes far beyond just one thing. Uh, and as you have made mention here this afternoon, there's many things in facility management that you have to think about. Um, any other things for maybe 2023 that we need to be looking at, keeping our eye on in the future? Well, health's always, you know, health and safety are always the, the, the top priorities. We can't do anything in our, in our organizations without making sure that those two uh, areas are, um, have a good solid base. Um, it, it really for me, and, and I think each one of these individuals will, will share their, their thoughts, but for me is continue to make sure that our staff has the resources to be able to do what they need to do, uh, respective to not just indoor air quality, but along, among many of the other things that uh, that we take on on a, on a regular basis. Um, and, and what I'm inferring by that is, um, I think resources are going to become scarce. Uh, financial resources are going to become scarce for public uh, institutions uh, moving forward. Uh, I think there's um, a lot of variables that will make it challenge, uh, challenging to maintain some of the funding levels that we currently um, currently have. Um, I think the, the I don't mean to get into politics, but I think you know the reality of some of the, the various things that are going on um, with uh, political um, bills, house bills being introduced, as well as um, uh, j just not being on the same page in, in, with, with certain uh, initiatives on within the individual school boards um, will be a challenge. So th those are the things that I know when I visit with our counterparts, as well as um, folks across the country uh, that we're all kind of watching. 
Kyle, what, what uh, uh, from a mechanical viewpoint, is there anything that you're watching? I mean, uh, I'm sure you've got enough things, but we're always looking ahead, right? Yeah, and as Saloon mentioned earlier, you know, just having a maintenance plan is so critical. And we, you know, in a district our size, we need to be replacing mechanical systems every single year. And um, it's just a really cha cha big challenge right now with the supply chain and be able to plan for those projects. Um, uh, it can take, well, I can't even give you a time. It, it's just an unknown. I mean, we just don't live in a in a world anymore where you can um, just, you know, bid a project and schedule your rooftop units to be replaced. And in schools, it's a huge challenge. Um, we are we're dealing with that at a school right now, having to, um, you know, we've got I don't know about fifteen rooftop units to replace. They were supposed to be replaced last year. Uh, only four of them have come in. And so we're kind of trying to figure out how to get those done during the school year, which is a challenge. Um, I don't even know for our mechanical work next summer if if we order equipment right now, if we can have it installed next summer. Yeah, you know, I was yeah. talking with the school district here in Florida that's got only four buildings, you know, and, and Saloon, you said, of any size. And so I'm going to go down to that small size you know, because people from all over the country listen to this podcast and, you know, yeah, if you've got 15 units, but this guy's only got four, but it's just as important for him to get that one he needs. And he said that he was ordering it last January, hoping that he'll get it for this coming summer. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the reality with that, Dave, I'm in the, in the middle of, or well, actually about I'm 50% done, but, um, as part of our large uh, HVAC cycle replacement, we had uh, 121 rooftop units and uh, wow. another oh another 21 boilers uh, as part of that project that um, we were in cycle replacement of. And I ordered all of that equipment in December of 2021. And uh, I won't have all of it uh, until December of 2022. Now, we've been able to, to, to do quite a bit of work. I've got most of my boiler work done, but I've had to push all of our rooftop unit work cycle replacement into next summer because there's a lot of logistics that go into that. You know, uh, some of these uh, systems are double wall systems, so they carry a greater weight load uh, than the current equipment. So we've got to do structural reinforcements respective to that. And um, I can't rip any of that equipment off and put the new stuff on if I don't have it. So it's kind of really delayed a lot of things respective to that because you, you, you need ventilation. We, we've been talking about that. And so, uh, really, the approach now um, is to really order your equipment ahead of time, almost a full year out, store it. And once it's all here, then you can start, you know, really scheduling that work. But it's difficult and challenging for people to uh, bid that work because they're obviously schedule driven and they're not just chasing your work. They're chasing everybody else's work. So that affects the overall budget because uh, you're probably going to need to do some of that work on premium time and or overtime to be able to just accomplish it. So it's it's really, as Kyle noted, it's really, really challenging, uh, but Luke, we're trying to make the best goal of it. Luke, I'm gonna come back to you because um, as you started our uh, podcast this afternoon, uh, you're the one consulting with all of these different ones and you hear these things. Um, there's a checklist, there's a list of everything. Um, I, I hate to call you the list guy, but yeah, no, I, I, we do have checklists for all these types of things. And I think, I, I just want to say this as we're kind of winding down here. I think what these gentlemen kind of exemplify is what I would just call good stewardship. Um, you've heard them talk about preventative maintenance. You've heard, heard them talk about how indoor air quality is part of their vision or part of their mission. And as a result, um, I've, I've been in this community since for the last 50 years. I grew up here. These two districts have always had wonderful support from their communities. Um, and it's because the district is a good steward 
of their community money. So when these guys go out and request bond issues um, or request funding, their communities are most of the time very, very supportive um, of those initiatives. I think what becomes sad is when you talk about these guys having to plan 18 months for a, 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 a unit replacement, um, which is just insane. Um, it's hard enough planning three months in advance, let alone 18 months in advance. So um, they're just dealt with some significant challenges right now with supply chain issues, um, some of those other infrastructure issues. A lot of companies are struggling with help. Um, so these roofing companies may have to delay things just because they're, they're not staffed properly. Um, but I do think, and I just want to kind of leave people with this message, um, the vision, if you have that vision, that long-term vision, you're going to be prepared for a lot of things um, that you wouldn't be prepared for normally. And I think these, these two gentlemen in their districts definitely exemplify that. You can't prepare for everything. Um, you have to be fluid. You have to be flexible. But again, I think understanding good preventative maintenance schedules, how to clean your buildings effectively, focusing on the health and the safety of the occupants, that's all you can ask for. Well, gentlemen, I think that probably wraps up what we needed to talk about with facilities management uh, and, and the issues. I mean, I could keep going on a whole lot, a lot of different things. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking from, from what Saloon was saying, you know, you got to work with these vendors. You got to figure that out. There's something always new coming along. Uh, just because we have a good policy and a plan out to get it today doesn't mean it's going to be the one we're going to be following this time next year. And unfortunately, we have environmental disasters that happen that then puts a stress on all of this stuff. And here in Florida, we just went through Ian here just recently. And um, I got to tell you, I'm hearing all of your units that you need and stuff, but there's buildings that are completely gone. They're going to be requiring those as well. You talk about indoor air quality. They can't even walk in the street. The outdoor air quality is worse than any indoor. Uh, it's always an issue when it comes to breathing. And somebody that suffers from COPD like I do, breathing is very, very important, folks. I got to tell you, if you can't breathe right, you can't learn, you can't work, you can't play, it affects everything in far more ways than what you think, um, uh, than what most people do, I think. Gentlemen, thank you for your time uh, this afternoon and being on the podcast. Hang tight because here in just a few minutes, uh, folks, we're going to bring on a whole new group of, well, just so happens the way it is, it's the women versus the men this afternoon. So <laughs> let's bring on the women and see what they've got to add to it. And then... Uh, We'll slowly progress over into their uh, part of it and we'll let the guys go home and do something else. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Kyle, Luke, good to see you. Nice to see you as well. Keep up the good work, you guys. All right. Thank you. Okay, so hang on tight, guys, because I'm just going to uh, uh, kind of give a little bit of break here. I'm not going to change the recording because if I stop the recording, then it screws everything up. So that's my break. And I'm just going to just leave you sit here on the screen and I'm just going to bring the ladies on as we did you. And uh, everybody say hi and kind of have a little bit of a discussion between what they heard from you talking, let them kind of bring that in. And then as we do, then I'll just slowly take you guys off and we'll transition into them. Once we're off, Dave, is it okay if we get back to work? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> like leave, leave. You're, you're working now. Come on, come on, Kyle. <laughs> hey, this is my part time job. <laughs> yeah, he needs his regular job. <laughs> you mean the one that pays you, the one that keeps you, keeps you in food? Yeah, I just didn't know if you were going to need us to come back in at all. So, no, 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 no. I just okay. kind of want I kind of think that because, uh, you know, we're not going to run these together, I'll, I'll, there'll be two different podcasts but I think it will also be beneficial to people that are listening to this to want to go to the next one. Yep. And that was kind of my idea when we put this together. I kind of like, uh, I'd seen some other, other people do that and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna try it myself. So here we go. Sounds good. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
So everyone, if you've been to our podcast before, you've heard us talk about indoor air quality. We are working through our series of indoor air uh, quality podcasts with the Center for Education and Safety uh, from the Missouri School Boards Association. And as you can see, I've got three gentlemen that are still here with me. We just talked about, well, facilities management and indoor air quality issues. Um, flu and RSV and air filters and chemicals. But you know what? We're going to transition just a little bit here and bring on a whole new group of people because they have a little different viewpoint because they're on the health side of it instead of the maintenance side of it. So if I can get all of the buttons to work right, folks. Now, if you're listening to the podcast, sorry, you can't see their pictures. But if you're watching, you get it all. So we're going to add to the stream here, Renee Faulkner. Okay, there's Renee. Do we have sound, Renee? Hello. There she is. We always like to hear a voice on the other end. Uh, we have your name, but what do you do and why are you here this afternoon? Well, um, I have been a school nurse for the past 22 and a half years. I retired last December and came on board to work uh, through a grant with the CDC Foundation with Marjorie Cole and the school health team at the Department of Health and Senior Services. Great, we talked with Margie on the, one of our other podcasts, so welcome to the panel. Uh, let's see here, I got another one here that's on that, uh, Deb Cook. Hi, I'm Deb Cook. I'm a school nurse with Kennett Public Schools. Um, I've been a school nurse for about 26 years and a certified asthma educator. And I'm also currently the chair of the Missouri Coordinated School Health Coalition. See, I told you folks, we were gonna have all the healthcare people on, so let's get this rolling. We're gonna finish off the panel this afternoon with Terry Hansen. Hi, I'm Terry Hansen. I'm the Health Services Coordinator for the Lee Summit R7 School District here in Missouri, and I'm also president of the Missouri Association of School Nurses. So, ladies, you were in the back room listening to the gentleman talk. I'm going to throw it over to you and let you kind of give us, well, your viewpoint of what you heard us discussing. Anybody can jump in. Go ahead, ladies. <laughs> I thought there were uh, several good points. I even always enjoyed listening um, to Luke and Kyle. This is the first time for me to hear Sloan, but um, there's, it's just so many things we need to make sure we're doing, and it's good to hear someone who is so wrapped up in it. Um, I loved when Sloan said about the key offenders, about the scented products, um, because I truly find that in my district so um, that was something that definitely uh, brought a smile. Um, so, and then I want to learn more about charging buckets. You know, I, I'm always um, anxious to hear the new and better things, the best practices. So that was something I, um, as a nurse, I hadn't heard that term before. Well, in that case, let's, you know, before he gets away from us, I think, Salum, you're the one that brought that up. So... Let's tell everybody what we're talking about. Yeah, Deb, uh, nice to meet you and uh, thanks for the question. So charging buckets really, um, <clears throat> it's taking your chemical solution and rather than putting it in a spray bottle, um, you, you pour it into a charging bucket where you apply it with a, um, a, a towel or uh, some form of cloth. Uh, and the thought process behind it, and Luke can kind of chime in respective to this, is whenever you spray chemicals or any type of uh, when you're using a spray in any environment there's always an ozone effect and depending on who the occupants are in that environment it may exasperate any uh, breathing challenges that they may have so by using a charging bucket you're applying the chemical directly on and uh, obviously most chemicals have a little bit of a dwell time and then coming back and, and wiping it off with uh, uh, water so that's really at the crux of it. That's what really what a charging bucket is. We've used charging buckets that are a, a wider, uh, we use flat mops essentially with microfiber on them. Yep. And so you can charge onto a 
a uh, piece of microfiber on a wider flat mop and then use that. Of course, you just keep that designated for desktops, countertops. Um, you can real quickly and efficiently now um, apply that solution to the surface. Uh, Kyle, as you're saying that, did you use any of that in the in the cafeteria, you know, for cleaning table, you know, uh, tabletops and stuff as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. Lots of square footage of tabletop in a cafeteria. Yeah, so that's a very efficient method of doing that. And if, and if you think about it, that technology has been around a while. I think uh, if, if you walk through any school cafeteria between lunch shifts, they're using charging buckets to clean those surfaces. And I think, ladies, what you're talking about here is this also um, is a not not from an efficiency standpoint only because it is, but it is a way to apply it more evenly uh, and, and actually you're getting the right amount of product where it needs to be, let alone the indoor air quality application, because as someone that suffers from breathing, uh, issues, anytime that you take a trigger sprayer and even this is at home, whatever it is, and you spray that into the air, it atomizes it. And then it's an in inhalant. And, you know, like I said, for me, it doesn't take much for me to start closing up. And I guarantee you. At about, uh, I think my uh, trilogy is like five hundred dollars a month. Um, I can tell you, those kind of things concern me. And we so do. From a nurse's viewpoint, what other issues that you heard the guys talking about that's of interest? I would like to mention that um, as I listened to the guys speak, it just brought it home to me so much about how this is really a group effort. I mean, we are all supposed to be keeping an eye on the environment, keeping an eye on what's affecting our students and our staff in the school building. And I would bet that um, these gentlemen that work in a school, I'll just bet that at some time, one of your school nurses has come to you and said, hey, I have a concern about this, or I have a concern about that. And um, that's just what we do. You know, school nurses are uniquely positioned um, to monitor the health and safety of students and staff. And so I think it's, we see it too, we bring it to you and then you guys do the fixing, right? So um, it, it just kind of brought it all home to me that uh, we're all part of the same team. So Luke, I would imagine that the nurses are on your checklist. Um, they're just part of that coordinated kind of school health effort. Um, they have that involvement. And um, a, a perfect example is I think I spoke to Deb about a dozen times at the beginning of the pandemic, and she was in a situation where either school board members wanted something, school administrators wanted something and purchased it, or the facility managers, and then she'd call me and say, or email me and say, hey, we just bought this product. Um, I'm not sure where we should use it or how we should use it. What are the hazards that I should be concerned with, et cetera? So a lot of times the nurses kind of were having to deal with things from their occupant health or worrying about their student health after the fact, after these things were introduced and then we started to see these implications. So Terry, I'm gonna come down to you here because I'm thinking as Luke says this, as president of, a, of an association, um, I don't think you see any of this, do you? Um, yeah. And luckily, I get to work with Kyle routinely. So I know that a couple of years ago, he would probably had my number blocked for a while um, <laughs> when we started into the pandemic. So, but it is interesting because there were so many things that people would read about, whether it's the school board or administrators or whatnot. And then they'd come to me, why don't we go get this? And then that's when we're calling Children's Mercy or we're working with our um facility managers to find out really, is it effective? What does the data show? And I think that's where we just really have to be on top of things just to continually see what the updated um, research studies are showing in all these products. Because as you know, we've learned a lot in the last two years through the pandemic and find out what really is best practice. So the question I have for everybody here, and I, I keep hearing this, um, before we let the guys go, 
why is it that we learned so much in the last two years? We didn't learn anything in the previous 10, 15 years. <laughs> you know, I, I keep hearing this. It's like, wait a minute. I, you know, uh, are, 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 are we going, are we still learning? Are we not going to learn in the future? I, you know, it's just an interesting, I guess, scenario, concept, whatever. Well, here's my perspective from an outsider looking into the school districts. Oftentimes, um, personnel and programs were sort of siloed. And what really happened during the pandemic is Kyle and Saloon, the facility managers, had to become experts on health. And the nurses who were experts on health had to become experts on buildings and filtration and HEPA filters and cleaning products. And so I think think now that everybody's just talking the same language and on the same page where before maybe we were a little more siloed, siloed or a little more segregated in terms of operational. So we've come out of our isolation and we're now uh, have understood we're all one big happy group. I think another part to that is, yes, we are a happy group now. We always are a happy group, but I think it was something we didn't know anything about. I mean, like everybody was trying to figure out how we were going to open school, how we were going to keep kids safe. And we all needed to learn everything we could about our own practice and each other's practice, that team practice. Just like I was calling and emailing Luke all the time. I was reaching out to different people. Same with Terry and Renee and Kyle. We were we were on webinars all the time. So it brought us all together to learn each other's um, practice and, and not be experts in it, but at least be aware of it. And um, so now we can be happy people again. Well, gentlemen, I'm going to let you go because i got a whole raft of questions. i got three nurses here and I want to talk some, I want to talk some health with them. Ladies, thank you for all that you do. We appreciate you taking care of our kids. Thank, thank you all. You. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you all. Take care.